Good morning, Harrow Baptist Church. Uh, we're excited to be together this morning to look at God's Word together. And uh, as we do begin, uh, just our only announcements really are that you are welcome to be here at the church at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Uh, you do not need to register. You can simply show up and uh, we, we have our in-person service at, at 10 o'clock um, with programs for children as well during that time. Uh, so you're certainly welcome to do that. You can turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. We're going to continue our series on the miracles of Jesus. Uh, we're going to take a break from Pastor Steve's series in Isaiah this week, and we're going to look at Mark chapter 1, look at our, our next miracle in our line as we've been doing. And as you turn to Mark chapter 1, let's open this morning. We're going to open in a word of prayer to ask the Lord's blessing on our time together today. Lord, we thank you for today. We're grateful for the day that you've given us to glorify you, to honor you, to worship you. And Lord, as we worship you now by reading your word, by hearing your word, by studying your word, we pray that you would use it to grow us and to shape us. Lord, that it would change us to be more into the likeness of Christ. We thank you for our church family. We thank you for uh, the body of believers that you have um, guided here together at Harrow Baptist. Lord, we pray that you would use us, you would grow us in our community, that we would be a light for Christ in our neighborhoods uh, with those around us. We're grateful for uh, the fact that you use us and you desire to make us more like the image of your son. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look in Mark chapter 1 this morning, we're going to start in verse uh, 29. Last time we looked at a miracle of Jesus. Jesus was teaching, if you remember, he was teaching in the synagogue. And that's when the crowds were looking at him. They were amazed at the, uh, the authority that he taught with, the authority that he acted with. Uh, and then remember, the man appeared with the, uh, the demon, being possessed by a demon. And Christ cast out the demon with that same authority uh, as well that he had just been speaking with, teaching with. Uh, Jesus is still in the region of Galilee. He's still in Capernaum. He is, and where we pick up this morning, he is just leaving the synagogue from where he has just cast out this demon in Capernaum. Uh, Galilee seems to be where Jesus is for the next little bit. Uh, he, the next few recorded miracles that we have in Mark or in other gospels are, are set in the region of Galilee. And remember, this is only about a year likely, uh, roughly a year after Jesus' baptism. By John the Baptist. So we're going to stay in, in, in Mark's gospel this morning, Mark chapter 1, which again is immediately after what we looked at last time as we, as we looked at Jesus' miracle. And actually we'll start in, um, in Mark chapter 1, verse 27. We looked at this last time, uh, but let's just read again as Jesus is, is leaving the synagogue. Mark chapter 1, verse 27. And they were all amazed, that's the crowd, they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere through all the surrounding region of Galilee. And last time we talked about that, we, we noted that Jesus would have had a lot of notoriety even before the event at the synagogue. So now this event in the synagogue only grows that popularity for Jesus. It's not the first time that Jesus has performed a miracle here. And we'll see that he goes on to perform another miracle as well. But our main takeaway, uh, as we looked at Jesus casting out the demon in the synagogue, um, was that we are forced, Mark's readers are forced to come uh, face to face with the authority of Jesus. And certainly the crowd in the synagogue is the same thing. They're forced to deal with what they believe about the authority of Jesus. He claimed it, he taught it, he proved it by what he did, and now they must either acknowledge it or uh, or deny it. They simply, simply cannot ignore it. So we're going to continue on. Mark chapter 1, look in verse 29. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. Then verse 32, That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. 
Um, I grew up watching The Price is Right. And The Price is Right, I know it's still going. I've, it's been a few years since I watched The Price is Right. But um, The Price is Right, I don't, I don't know if it does anymore. It used to, used to air on weekdays at 11 o'clock in the morning. So I would come home uh, for lunch from school and I'd be able to catch the end of The Price is Right. And the end is the most exciting part because you had your, uh, your two contestants who were left at the end. They each had a showcase. They were shown prizes that they must bid on. Closest bidder to their prize uh, got to win the showcase. So very exciting, right? So as we watch uh, The Price is Right, that's the premise. You're bidding on prizes uh, to see who can be the closest to the price of the actual prizes. But there would even be special episodes of The Price is Right, and these special episodes simply ramped things up. So uh, the prizes were more expensive, they were more elaborate, the trips were greater, were longer, the cars were nicer, uh, whatever the case may be. These spectacular episodes, I think they used to call them the million dollar spectacular, right? They were more expensive in the prizes that the contestants were able to win. And I remember watching an episode uh, many years ago now, um, and, and the final showcase was being introduced. And usually uh, the announcer wouldn't be Bob Barker. The announcer would announce what's behind the first door type thing, second door, third door. There was typically three prizes. And usually if there was going to be a car in the showcase, the car was the last thing because that was the most exciting prize. That was the biggest prize of them all. Uh, to be lumped in, in together. But on these spectacular episodes, I remember watching an episode and they're announcing the final showcase, what the prizes are. And they open the first curtain and the first curtain was a brand new car, right? Remember they used to announce a, a brand new car and they would announce what, what is behind the door. But that was the first door and I remember sitting there thinking this is going to be unbelievable because if they're showing a car already, that means the prizes are only going to get better and better and better as they go along. And sure enough, all three of the prizes included in this one showcase were three cars. So three times they would open the door and say, a brand new car, right? And the, the fans, the crowd would be all excited, cheering. And just as that would start to die down, uh, you know, Bob, Bob Barker would say, what's next? And they would open the next door and he'd say, a brand new car. And that just got the fans, just got the crowd excited again. It was a back-to-back-to-back, -to -back -to -back, three brand new cars that caused so much excitement, so much thrill for the people watching. And I feel like as Jesus is performing miracles here, I can't think that it's something similar. We can hardly catch our breath from when Jesus cast out the demon in the temple and then he's at Peter and Andrew's house and he's healing someone else. Then we can hardly catch our breath from that. And that evening, there's many people who are brought and Jesus is healing them. The excitement is ramping up and just does not seem to stop. All of these events happen on the same day. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record these miracles back to back. Uh, they're happening all together within a 24-hour period. And hopefully this morning, as we look at uh, these miracles that we just read about, we'll see the significance behind them uh, of Christ doing them in rapid, rapid succession. So Jesus leaves the synagogue with four of his disciples. He leaves uh, with Peter, Andrew, John, and James. So you have two sets of brothers that Jesus leaves the synagogue with. And if we're in, if we're in the disciples' shoes at this point, when we're when we're leaving the synagogue, they're leaving. Um, they are now headed to Peter and Andrew's house. Mark records it as Simon. That's Simon Peter, so forgive me. I'll, I'll refer to him as Peter. They're heading to Peter and Andrew's house. And archaeologists have actually, they believe they've found Peter's house. They believe they found the spot where Jesus is going here in Mark chapter 1. And it's not very far from the, uh, from the ruins of the temple, the synagogue in Capernaum. So they have the ruins of the synagogue in Capernaum, the ruins of the house uh, that they believe is Peter's, and they're just a short short distance away. Um, from Scripture, we learn that Peter lives with his family. He lives with his wife, his children, clearly his mother-in-law. And he lives with, we assume as well from Scripture, that he lives with Andrew, his brother, and he lives with Andrew's family. And this would not have been out of the ordinary for a Jewish family in Jesus' day. 
but what archaeologists have discovered is that Peter's house doesn't appear to be one giant building, maybe like we picture today or we can assume today. Most houses here, and, and what they believe is Peter's house as well, were set up with a courtyard style house, almost like a complex where you walk into a plaza, you walk into a courtyard, and there's dwellings, there's rooms off of it, and the courtyard is sort of the central meeting place. But as we said, archaeologists believe they found Peter's house not very far, just a short walk from the synagogue here in Capernaum. So because of that close proximity to the synagogue, it would have made sense for them to invite Jesus, James, John to their house after the service on the Sabbath at the synagogue. That would have likely ended around noon. So it makes sense, right? They're, they're standing around, say, where do you want to go? Say, well, we just live around the corner. Let's go over there. We can have something to eat. We can have a meal. But when they enter here, they would have found themselves in a plaza-type setting, walking into this courtyard-type setting with houses, with rooms, with dwelling places all around the outside. And look in verse 29. Immediately he left the synagogue, entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Verse 30 of Mark 1. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her, and she began to serve them. Some have suggested that Peter may have had ulterior motives for inviting Jesus to his house uh, for lunch um, because his mother-in-law was sick. He knew his mother-in-law was ill, and we probably can't blame Peter for that, right? Peter has just witnessed Christ do some amazing things, and so uh, maybe in his mind he's thinking, my mother-in-law is ill, she's around the corner, why don't I invite Jesus for lunch? And while Jesus is there, maybe there's something Jesus can do for her to help her out. So we don't blame blame him for doing that. Um, we're not 100% sure how dire the situation was with Peter's mother-in-law. When Luke records this gospel, he records it not simply as a fever, but he records it as a high fever. Luke's a doctor, so we, we see maybe why he focused on that aspect of it, even in a simple way. Um, but we see that she may have had a high fever. We also see that she didn't come to greet Jesus, which typically would have been the practice someone shows up at your house for a meal, typically, if you're able, you're likely going to come out and to greet them. And Peter's mother-in-law doesn't do that. She's constrained to her bed. So uh, likely her situation is not good. We don't know how not good, but but certainly a fever, a high fever uh, that she had. So she's there in the house of Peter. Jesus walks into the plaza and he's likely called into the specific uh, dwelling place that she is. They've just seen Jesus do something miraculous at the synagogue, and now they appeal to him on behalf of, of Peter's mother-in-law. And of course, as we read, we just read it, Jesus takes her by the hand and we're told that the fever left her. Like nothing, her effortless for Jesus. Just as the demon fled from the presence of Jesus earlier in the day, at the synagogue, this fever, fever has no other option but to leave Peter's mother-in-law, and she is restored to health. But in this miracle, we notice a few things that have ramifications. They have consequences uh, for us to, to at least acknowledge, to look at. First of all, notice how Jesus heals her. Mark describes how Jesus heals her. says, he came, took her by the hand, lifted her up. Uh, likely lifting her up out of, out of bed is what, what Mark means by that. So he took her by the hand, he lifted her up. Remember a bit ago, a, a couple miracles ago, we looked at um, when that Jesus performed, the man uh, who traveled many miles because his son was sick. So the man who left his family, left his son who was sick, who was dying, went to find Jesus, walked 15, 20 miles away to find Jesus, to try to plead with Jesus to come back with him to heal his son. And Jesus didn't go back with him. Jesus simply told him uh, that your son has been healed. He, he refused to go back. He, he stayed where he was told the man, go back to your son. Your son's fine. He's been healed. The man uh, believed Jesus, then walked back and, of course, sees his son uh, was healed at the very hour that Jesus had said it. But Jesus didn't go with him. Uh, Jesus simply healed him from where he was, being miles away from the nobleman's son. And that miracle gave us a greater understanding of the power of Christ, that Christ doesn't even have to be in the same room as someone in order to heal them. Or in that case, Christ doesn't even have to be in the same city as someone in order to heal them. 
Here in Mark 1, though, Christ goes in right into the room where Peter's mother-in-law is. He goes right up to her. He heals her. He takes her hand. He lifts her up. She's healed. She's better. The severity of the fever is irrelevant to Christ. Now, we ultimately don't know the difference. Why? We don't know why Christ decided simply to tell the nobleman um, that his son was healed and decides to go into Peter's mother-in-law rather than just standing in the plaza and speaking uh, in her direction, pointing in her direction, whatever whatever he wanted to do in order to heal her, heal her because he certainly could have done that. But we certainly see Jesus' compassion here. He wanted to be physically present with Peter's mother-in-law when he healed her. Of course, Jesus shows compassion to anyone that he heals. Many people and other miracles that Jesus performs are done because of his compassion. Uh, if you remember the, the miracle when Jesus raises the, the son of the widow, raises the widow's son from the dead. Luke chapter 7, Luke records that. We'll get to that eventually as we're down the road in miracles. But uh, Luke chapter 7, Jesus says, When he saw her, so when Jesus saw the widow whose son had just died, when he saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. So the, the reason that he told her not to, to weep, and we see that just before he raises then the son from the dead, we're told that Jesus has compassion on this widow. In Matthew chapter 15, the feeding of the 4,000, Matthew records, uh, Jesus' explanation was that he had compassion on the people, and that's his reason for feeding them. Matthew 15, 32, Jesus called his disciples and to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. So Christ says that because of his compassion for them, he's unwilling to send them away without food. So he then feeds the 4,000 with seven loaves and a few fish. That doesn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us, the compassion of Christ, because Christ's compassion lines up exactly with God the Father's compassion. We're told that God the Father cares about the birds of the field, uh, the, the lilies, the flowers. He cares about all these things. So, of course, Christ would care for Peter's mother-in-law. Of course, Christ would care for the nobleman and his son. Of course, Christ would care for uh, the widow and her son, the 4,000 people. Of course, he would have compassion on them just as he would any other person. And Christ shows that compassion not just by the fact that he heals her, but even in the method that he chooses to heal her. John Calvin says this when referring to this miracle, though he could have done it with a knot alone, in other words, Christ could have healed her with a knot alone, simply nodding his head, though he could have done it with a knot alone, yet he took her hand because he knew the gesture at the time would have value. So not only does Jesus show compassion by how he heals her, but taking her hand as a woman, remember that during Christ's day, this would have been an extra generous gesture towards any woman in the culture for Christ. So first we see the authority, as always, in the healings of Jesus, but also we see the compassion that he displays perfectly and specifically to this woman. And then secondly, look at at what happens immediately after she's healed. Look in verse 31. Uh, And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve him. So the fever left her, and Mark says, and she began to serve him. Almost like a cause and effect type thing, right? She's healed, therefore she began to serve him them. Her purpose for being healed wasn't so that she could live an easy life. Her purpose for being healed wasn't so that she could live necessarily a carefree life. But her purpose, Christ's purpose for healing her was ultimately for the glory of Christ, for the glory of his name. Don't get me wrong, that's not a loom and gloom. That's not, well, now I got to serve Christ because he's provided this miracle in my life. Don't get me wrong. It's a joy to serve the Lord. And Peter, Peter's mother-in-law is healed here. And then she proceeds to serve Christ in joy to him for what he has done for her. If we look at ourselves, Christ has performed miracles among all of us. Even in something as foundational as our salvation. Not so that then we can live an easy life. Not so we can live a carefree life. But so that we can serve and glorify him. 
Christ came. Christ came to live a perfect life. He came to prove that he was God's son, which is what many of the miracles do, all the miracles do. He came full of humanity and full of deity at the same time, came to die on the cross, to raise victorious, to also prove his deity, meaning that you and I and anyone else now has the opportunity to accept his gracious gift of salvation freely through faith, not on, not through anything we can do or anything that we think we can do, but simply by faith. But what's the purpose? Why do we, by faith, accept God's gift of salvation? Yes, for eternal life with him. Of course, for eternal life uh, with Christ, with God the Father. But also to serve Christ as the woman does here, to bring glory to his name in the meantime. Very well-known passage, Ephesians uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 8. Paul lays out a very clear picture of the gospel in Ephesians 2 verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We, We sometimes stop there. Verse 10, though. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So Paul tells us we are saved by faith or saved by grace, sorry, through faith. Yes, of course, but we're saved for a purpose. We're saved. We're created for good works. We are created to serve him. We are not created to live for ourselves. After Christ has saved me from an eternity apart from him to an eternity with him through his compassion and grace, my only reaction is to desire to serve him with my life. Because although our salvation saves us for eternity, we begin to experience that salvation even here on earth to a small degree. Certainly not to the degree that we will uh, once we die, but to a small degree we experience salvation right now, the joy of our salvation. We can already have joy in our salvation. We don't have to wait. Christ doesn't heal people or cast out demons just for the fun of it. He has a purpose for doing so. His purpose for doing that is for their good and for his glory. Another commentator says on this passage as well, The same hand that healed her strengthened her so that she was able to minister. The cure is in order to fit for action. The same is true for us. Christ does miracles in us. Christ saves us for our good and for his glory and to make us fit for action. Then very quickly, Mark sets uh, this scene where the whole city is gathering at the door. Look, look in Mark chapter 1, verse 32. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because uh, because they knew him. Again, as with past miracles, Christ doesn't permit the demons to speak, and so they don't. End of story. He shows his authority over them yet again, simply because of the fact that he doesn't permit them to do something, they literally cannot do it. They must obey him. So the healing of Peter's mother-in-law sets up the events of these consequent healings that evening. Many other people uh, in the same place coming to Peter's house. Uh, and, and, and in the same way as Peter's mother-in-law is healed, anytime someone is healed by Jesus, it's complete. It's immediate. Jesus didn't tell Peter's mother-in-law um, that she's healed, but she needs to rest in bed for a week or 10 days, and then she'll be back to full health. No, he, he heals her completely and immediately so that she is able to, to serve them right away. So this is Jesus' day. Jesus is at the synagogue. He casts out the man, or casts out the demon within the man. He goes back to Peter's house. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. The word spreads, and Mark spreads, and Mark says that the whole city shows up at Peter's house. And all these events that likely seem hectic, we get a picture of the humanity of Christ right after. And this is what we'll look at these last few verses here. Look at what Jesus does the next day after after Jesus' long day of healing here. Uh, Verse 35 of Mark chapter 1. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. 
Jesus, the Son of God, got up early ne- the next morning and went to pray. After an exhausting day of ministry, Jesus retreats to pray, to commune with his Father. And likely, Jesus' sleep that night was likely only a few hours, but he rises early anyway. So although Jesus shows his power through the healings that he performed the day before, he gives us insight into the power behind his ministry. The actions of Christ follow because he was in constant and consistent communication, communion with the Father. We know from the Gospels this is not an isolated situation either. Christ is seen to go and spend time alone with the Father many times uh, through the Gospels. And prayer was so important to Christ that he went to the trouble of teaching his disciples how to pray in the same way. So if fellowship with the Father is important to Christ, who is one with the Father, how much more important is it for us as God's people to be in communion uh, with God the Father? And then at the closing of the small section, Mark's going to reveal to us the purpose that Christ had during his ministry. Look in 36. And Simon, that's Peter, and Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. So when Simon Peter, when others eventually find Christ... They were likely excited to tell him that everyone's looking for him. Jesus, remember all the miracles you did last night? People are now lining up again at my house this morning. They're waiting for you. They're, uh, they're looking for you. And I'm sure the disciples were excited for Christ to continue to gain popularity, to continue to gain notoriety uh, because of the healings the day before. And, and, and certainly uh, this past year of ministry, when they find Jesus... Uh, The Gospel of Luke, when Luke records this event, Luke records that the crowd actually came to Jesus and the crowd wanted him to stay with them, implored him to stay, was disappointed when Jesus said he wouldn't stay. And we really can't blame them for that. But we see that Jesus doesn't stay. He doesn't stay there. He says, let's go to other towns so I can preach there because that's why I came. Then Mark tells us they went throughout the region of Galilee, they preached, they cast out demons. And the question I ask here is why? Why? Why didn't Jesus stay? Why didn't he continue to minister? Why didn't he continue to heal the people in Capernaum? Why did he leave? Why did he go anywhere else? And likely Peter, Andrew, James, and John may have had those same same questions as well. We've got a pretty good thing going here. This last day has been pretty exciting. Let's let's stick around for a little bit. And as we look at the text, they tell Jesus everyone is looking for them. Or sorry, everyone is looking for him. Everyone is looking for Jesus. And we just naturally ask ourselves why. Why is everyone looking for Jesus? And it's a really obvious answer, right? Clearly, why is everyone now the next morning after all these miracles looking for Jesus? Because of what happened the day before. It's clear why they're looking for Jesus. It's obvious. They wanted to see him because of the miracles that he was performing. And there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. But Jesus knows their hearts. Jesus knows why they want to see these miracles. Jesus wants to know why they want to see more of these miracles. And the reaction of Jesus shows us that it's a similar occurrence that we see other times in the Gospels. Where people are following Jesus and they're only doing so because they want to see a miracle. Or they're only doing so because they want a miracle done for them. After Jesus feeds the 5,000, there's similar sentiment in John chapter 6. Jesus said, Jesus answers them. This is Jesus speaking to the people after he has just fed them after he's just fed the 5,000. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. In other words, they're just trying, they just want to fill their bellies. They're in it to see what Jesus can do for them. They're not in it to see who Jesus truly is, the purpose behind the signs, the purpose beside behind the miracles, behind the wonders. And Jesus here gives us his purpose for coming. It's not just to fill their bellies. It's not just to take away their fever. It's not just to cast out demons. His purpose for coming is to preach the good news of the gospel. His miracles were not the main reason 
that he came. His miracle simply proved uh, who he is and, and who he said that he was. Jesus gives his priority of ministry recorded in the beginning of Mark. We looked at this last time a couple times ago. I don't remember. Mark chapter 1 and verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. And this is, um, this is Jesus' purpose and saying, this is what Jesus says, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's why Jesus came. He came to preach the gospel, came to call people to repentance, came to call them to believe in the gospel of Christ. So yes, Jesus was concerned with people's physical ailments. He was concerned with their fevers. He's concerned with their blindness. He's concerned with many other things. But he was here to preach the good news of the gospel. He wasn't as worried about their physical problems that we have. He's not as worried about our physical problems. He's more concerned with our spiritual brokenness because of our sin, because of our rebellion against God. Jesus ultimately knew that the result of his preaching would be his death. He ultimately knew that the result of his preaching uh, would, be his, would be his crucifixion on the cross, which would pay the penalty for our sin. And then he knew his resurrection would come, which would then again prove that he is who he says he is. After all, in Luke chapter 19, Jesus says this about himself, the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Some have used this idea that Jesus is concerned with our eternal problem as opposed to our temporal problems, and and they almost make it a, a one or the other rather than a both. But some have used this idea to say that since Jesus cares about our eternal situation more than our temporal situation, that that's our mindset as well. That we care for Jesus, or we care for people's eternal problem, and we don't really care about their temporal problem. We don't provide for the needy. We don't care for the needy. We don't care for the widow, the orphan, whatever the case. The problem with that is not only does that go against what Christ did and what Christ lived and what Christ said, it also goes against what the rest of Scripture says. You and I are not a follower of Christ because we care for the needy. You and I care for the needy because we are followers of Christ. James chapter 2. James says this in verse 15. When speaking of how believers, how, how disciples of Christ are to treat the needy. James chapter 2 verse 15. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith without faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. As a follower of Christ, the driving force of my compassion is the grace and mercy that Christ has shown to me. But Christ saying that his purpose is to come and to preach the gospel shows us that the things that he did, including his miracles, were not simply to ease someone's pain. Although when Jesus uh, removed the fever or healed these, these many people after, yes, that eased their pain. But that was not his purpose or his ultimate purpose, I should say. The purpose of his miracles was to prove who he was and also to point the individual to their need for Christ. And sometimes when Jesus healed an individual, they turned to Christ, they acknowledged who Christ was, and sometimes they did not. So for us as believers, for us as followers of Christ, we care for the needy, not so that they'll simply have their physical needs met, but so that they see a picture of what Christ has done for them. Our actions and our evangelism go hand in hand. Now, there are things that Christ did that you and I clearly will never do. Growing up, there was a few years a fad that came out, and it was these bracelets that came out. You, you put this bracelet on your hand, and it would say, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Uh, and, and the idea was that if, if you have this bracelet on your hand that says, what would Jesus do? When you're faced with a situation, you would uh, stop and react. Uh, should I talk back to my parents this way? Should I speak to a friend this way? What would Jesus do? Would he act in such a way? And I get the idea, and maybe that can be helpful to us at some point, but there are certainly things that Jesus can do, could do, and Jesus did that you and I should not do. Jesus had authority that you and I do not have and will never have. But if we're taking a cue, if we're looking at Jesus this morning, we're trying to take a cue from him this morning, I think a cue that we can take 
is to care for those around us so that they have a clear picture of the gospel. We care for the needy, not so simply that their physical needs are met, although that's part of it. We care for them so that they see their need uh, for the gospel. They have a clear picture of the gospel because of how we treat them. That includes both the fellow believer and the believer. My interaction with my church family, with brothers and sisters in Christ, my interaction with you should be, ought to be, a reflection of the gospel in my life. And my interactions with the person down the street or the parent that my kids go to daycare with or the person that I work with, my interactions with them, with an unbeliever, ought to also reflect the gospel in my life. This is why the gospel is so important, not only for our eternity, but for us today, for us now. Are you allowing the gospel to shape your relationships? Are you allowing the gospel to shape your words, to shape your thoughts? Since I've been shown the grace, mercy, and compassion of the gospel, grace, mercy, and compassion must be evident in my life to those around me. Not for my salvation, but because of my salvation. I'm a new creation. God has made me new because of my salvation, because of the Holy Spirit's work in my life. And that will be evident in the way that I live my life. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for your word. And Lord, I pray for each of us. I pray for myself this week that you would stretch me, grow me, Lord, that that your gospel would shape all that I do, all that I say, all that I am, that I would approach those around me with grace and mercy and compassion because of the grace and mercy and compassion that I have been shown through Christ, through his cross, and through his resurrection. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy and your compassion in our lives, Father, each and every day. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, As I said, uh, we are we are having us. We do have services in person, 10 a.m. at the church on Sunday mornings. You are certainly welcome to that. You're certainly welcome to uh, continue to join us online. We are praying for you. We pray that you have a great week. And uh, we hope to see you soon.